you might want to spend a little bit of time reading the problem many, many times, two or three times, maybe the first time through to, de to decide if it's a whole number answer is expected or a probability is expected, number between zero and one. But remember um, what kind of the overlying in all of these problems, the overlying, um, I don't know, property that we have is the multiplication property. You know, how many different operations are there? How many different decisions do you need to make? And then you just multiply them together. Mrs. Clinton has five bracelets, four necklaces, and seven sets of earrings. In how many ways? So that's talking about a whole number there. All right. Five pass. So she selects the neck uh, the bracelet. There's four different ways to do that. Or if you like, from the five bracelets, choose one. Five choose one is five. Then choose one of four necklaces. Of the four necklaces, choose one. Times, and then there are seven sets of earrings. Of the seven sets of earrings, choose one. So yeah, we just multiply those, those numbers together and, and come up. There's no permutation implied here. Uh, remember permutations and combinations, you have to select R objects from the total of N. And then permutations, after you choose those, you then have to multiply by the number of possible arrangements. Okay, the digits, uh, not all the digits, so pay attention here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there's not all of them. There. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven different digits are used to form three digit numbers. All right, so we'll just say the number of ways to choose the first digit and then the second digit and then the third digit and then multiply them all together. So we'll think about it in this way. Again, it's gonna be a whole number because they ask you for how many ways, how many different numbers there are. Now, that wouldn't take too long. If you wanted to, you could just use this definition and just start writing them down. There's only a thousand of them. Just write down all the numbers from 000 up to 999. And just go circle the ones that match this. Eventually you'd get a, you'd probably make an error here and there though, so you'd be off by a little bit. Or you can choose the multiplication property. Are used to form three digit numbers. How many numbers larger than 600? Okay, so this, let, this first digit then can be in the 600s or the 700s or the 800s, but could not be in the 500s because then the number wouldn't be larger than 600. And you, and you can't include a nine here because nine is not one of our digits. So there's only a six or a seven or an eight that you can put there, three possible digits to make the number 600 or more. All right, <clears throat> now uh, if it says, if repetitions are allowed, so we could have, for example, 677, because repetitions are allowed. But we couldn't have 699, not because repetitions are not allowed, but because the digit nine is not allowed. Okay, so with those two ideas in mind, um, we will allow any digit to be this one. We've already got our numbers in the 600s, 700s, and 800s. So we're gonna allow all of those, all seven of them. And since we'll allow repetitions, the last one can be seven as well. So we just multiply those. Those are the three operations. Three times seven times seven is 147. Only 147 numbers. Okay, I'll look, I'll look in the chat after every problem. So if, if there is a problem that you'd like to see, then you know, we can we can certainly do that. I'll look in the chat after each each problem. Okay, some of these I'm not going to work out. Maybe I'll I will. But your English professor um, gives a reading list of seven books. So just imagine there's seven books out there. You can choose three. There's no mention that you have to read them in a particular order. You can read them in any order. So order doesn't matter here. But you're choosing seven. It's doubtful that those seven books would include include two to, uh, two books of the same kind. You know, <laughs> it would be kind of silly, right, to say, here, you have to, we have to choose from these seven books, uh, but three of them are, you know, war and peace. No, we, they, they would all be different. And that's one of the key features of a permutation and combination. You're selecting a smaller number 
from a larger set of distinct. So the books will not be the same. But order is not in matter. You can read them in any order. So this is a combination. This is the kind of reasoning that you go through. And then after that, it's just, you know, of the seven books, choose three. And you just plug it into the calculator to get the correct number. Okay. Um, D, in how many different ways can a group of eight people select a president, a vice president, and secretary? Okay. Now, it depends. It, it, it matters if, you know, you could have the same three people, lots of different ways to select the same three people. But if you want to then assign them roles like president and vice president and secretary, if you just select these three people, presidents, vice president and secretary, that's a different kind of executive committee, if you will, than say BAC, same three members, but they're assigned different positions. So in this case, order matters. And when order matters, all right, you're selecting three from a larger group of eight, and then order matters. So one way we can think about it is that I'm going to, from the eight, choose three. This is what I was trying to show you on one of the um, problems on the review. But order matters. So now we have to order these three. So what we're going to do is we're going to permute those three, three at a time. And a permutation like this is just three factorial. So you can do eight choose three and then multiply it by three factorial, or you can just permute eight three at a time. So this and this are equivalent. Sometimes it's more advantageous to do this, to use this process, 336. Eight, two, um, order three, there it is. Or you can take eight and then multiply it by three factorial. So you should get the same thing. Or if you want me to write it out even further, eight math three three times three math. So choose the three and then order them all. Once you get the three, order them, arrange them. So you can think about it in a lot of different ways. Okay, nothing in the chat yet. So we'll just kind of uh, continue to work through these. Uh, you can think of these two as going together and these two as going together because they both have, uh, you know, kind of the same 45 good, five defective, 50 total. So a lot of times they don't give you the total, but it's something good to, to write down. It's kind of an easy calculation, just an addition. Nowhere in this problem is 50 mentioned, but they're either good or they're not. They're good or they're defective, two different outcomes. In a sample of three circuits, so we're going to take a sample, so order doesn't matter. We just want three. Of the boards, there's no mention here if we want three good ones or we want three bad ones or a combination, so we're just going to select three. Order doesn't matter. 50, choose three. All right, in the next one, F, same part, in a sample of three circuit boards, okay, a new question. How many ways? So again, this is a problem that's asking for a whole number. How many ways can something happen? We're counting um, versus what's the probability. And how many ways can more than one, more than one defective circuit board be selected? So more than one would mean two defective or three defective. Now we don't want any more than three to be defective because we're only choosing a sample of three. But we're lacking over here because over here, if we choose do two defective, we don't quite yet have our sample of three. So it goes without saying that we have one good one. If we have only two defective, we have to have one good one. If we have three defective, if you want, you can say zero good ones. But just make sure that you've selected all three of your in your sample. So this one we would say, all right, so there are five defective and there's 45 good. So if we want two defective, we have to select from the defective. 
So that's five, choose two. Over here, five, choose three, and we're done because we're not choosing more than three. Over here, we've chosen our two defective. Now we have to go choose one more to make out to round out our sample of three. So from the 45 that are good, we're going to choose one. Now I break them up this way because there are going to be no samples that are going to appear here and here at the same time because they're two completely, we would call mutually disjoint, mutually exclusive samples. You can't have a sample that has two defective, exactly two defective, and at the same time have that sample have three defective. They've got to be one or the other. So this is how we handle more than one. More than one would be two, three. We don't want to say four defective because we only want a sample of three. So we take those, multiply them, take this, and then add them together. And I guess we get uh, 5,410 different ways. Okay. Uh, G, three married couples. Again, I'm not seeing anything in the chat, so I'm just kind of going to go along here. Um, you have a Venn diagram problem here. Uh, here's your expected value problem up here. You have the insurance policy on the, on the sample. Um, these here are just basic probabilities in games of chance, like rolling a die or rolling two dice or flipping five coins or selecting a face card or a spade. This one here is the survey problem where you enter numbers in here and then calculate a probability based on the numbers in here. And the probability, okay, so this is a probably a probability that involves either the multiplication rule or, or the complement rule. And then down here, what is the probability of laying off one employee from each of the three cities? When you understand this for, um, I can understand that this is very, very difficult. But, um, you know, when I look at these problems here, um, they're, they're basically, they all look the same to me. The contexts are, the, are different, but I'm looking at what am I choosing from and how many am I choosing? And how many am I choosing from this subgroup? And how many am I choosing from that subgroup? And does it only take one choice or does it take multiple choices to accomplish, to accomplish what I want to accomplish? And then here's a um, one with a tree diagram where you're selecting balls from boxes. Here's an empirical probability question. And then we're back to some more in how many ways, how many ways, how many ways. So we're back to the chapter seven, chapter eight problem. All right. So if there's something in there you want to work through, we can, we can work through. Okay, G. We've got uh, three married couples, all right? So let's assume that the couple is male and female for this example, are seated on a bench. And how many different seating arrangements? Okay, so now we wanna count up. There's no mention of a probability here. So we're not going to have a number between zero and one. We're actually gonna have probably a, a fairly large number. There's no restriction on seating order. Three married couples, Okay, so we have six individuals, don't care where they see, sit, but they are arrangements. And so we can't just choose the six people. We have to choose them and then order them. All right, so from the six people, without regard to gender, we want to choose them and then arrange them. Or if you like, we're just going to arrange them. Or if you like, six factorial, or if you like one, two, three, four, five, six, how many of those six individuals can sit to the far left? Six. After that person is placed, how many people are left without regard to gender who can sit in the next spot? Five. Oh, yeah, thank you. One person is already seat seating, and so there's five remaining, and then just keep continue to go down, and you can see that it's the six factorial. So you could even do this one with the um, you know, multiplication rule. Choose who sits to the far left, choose who sits next to them, choose who sits next to them, and then so on. And this is 720. 
All right, now we get into some restrictions. And so what we want to say here is that we, <clears throat> they're seated on a bench. How many different seating arrangements are possible? The men have to sit together and the women have to sit together. So there are two different places where the men can choose, the men can sit. The men can sit to the, because they all have to be together. They can sit to the left on the bench or they can sit to the right. So the first choice we're gonna make is to choose one. And what we're choosing is where the men are gonna be sitting. Now, once we know that the men are sitting to the, to the left or to the right, wherever we choose, then we have to arrange them because arrangements in a seating, as they're sitting along a bench, arrangements matter. And so the next thing we wanna do is of the three men, we wanna permute them, arrange them, then the men are all arranged. Number of ways the men can be arranged. Then we want to arrange the female. Well, there are three of them as well. And we want to arrange them. So two times six times six, 72. There are 72 different arrangements where the men sit together and the women sit together. There are 720 different arrangements of the six people. So in how many of them would, what's the probability that all the men and the women will be together? 72 out of 720. So the probability would just be taking this one and this one and combining them together. And uh, then you're gonna see some abstract problems like this one and put numbers into a Venn diagram and you can answer all kinds of probabilities from that. Sometimes if you're given these guys here, you might wanna write down the formula that goes along with them. So the probability of F complement is one minus the probability of F. So if you just write the formula down, like this, and you notice that up here in the top, they give you the probability of F, you can calculate this pretty quickly. Odds for F is the probability of F divided by the probability of F complement. So if you just use that formula, the probability of F is up here in the stem of the problem, 0.75. And the probability of F complement, we just calculated in part A to be 0.25. Right, so that's three over one. So odds for E would be three over one, the odds against, and odds for F would be three over one, the odds against F would be one over three. Probability of E given F, that's the probability of E and F divided by the probability of F. And F, E and F is the same thing as E intercept F. So if I could figure out the answer to part B, I could use it in part C because I already know what the probability of F is right there. All right, so I'm going to use the probability of E union F is the probability of E plus the probability of F minus the probability of E intersect F. This is called the addition rule. And the union would be everything inside the circles. If we add E, all of E and all of F, we will have counted this middle twice. So we subtract it out once so that we kind of make the formula meaningful. All right, uh, we have these three numbers and this is the one we're trying to find. Probability of E is 0.41. Probability of F is 0.75. And the probability of E union F is 0.91. So you could figure out, you could deduce what the probability of E intersect is based on the other three numbers that, that you're given. This is point or 1.16. And if you subtract 1.16 here, you're gonna find that the probability of E intersect F is 0.25. All right, so that goes here. And so then if we use the conditional probability formula, E and F, this piece in here, divided by the probability of F, which is this whole piece, 0.25 over 0.75, one third. And then if you wanted to you know, put some probabilities in here, uh, the intersection is 0.25. Uh, the probability of E is 0.41. So 0.16 has to be out here so that these two numbers add up to 0.41. These two numbers here have to add up to the probability of F, which is 0.75. So out here has to be 0.50, so that those two add up to 0.75. And we have 0.25 in the middle. 
And when you add those three, we already know that that's going to be 0.91. So outside here must be 0.09. And you know, sometimes if you write those probabilities in there, you can answer some of these probabilities from the Venn diagram as well. Uh, mutually exclusive, no, since the probability of E intersect F is not equal to zero. In order for two events to be mutually exclusive, there can't be anything in their intersection. They have to look like this. Mutually exclusive, nothing in the intersection. Moving on, you know, I don't think uh, my math lab is going to be giving many hints, you know, like I would say a tree diagram will be helpful here and I draw the tree diagram. Um, so this is something that you're going to have to, you know, tell yourself, you know, can I use a formula? Can I use a counting principle? Can I use a tree diagram? Draw a picture, six white and four black. So 10 balls, white equals six, black equals four, total equals 10. All right, what are we going to do with this one? Oh, it's got a second box. First and second. Three whites and six blacks. So that's nine, nine balls total. And we have three whites and six blacks. A ball was picked from the first box and placed into the second box. A um, you know, ball is then presumably they're mixed, mixed together. Uh, and then we're going to select a ball from the second box. So what we end up with is just a single ball in our hand. What is the probability that it, the ball that remains, is white? And if we end up with a white, that means the second ball that we selected was white. Doesn't matter what the first ball is, because we're just going to drop it in the second, second bo um, box. Okay, so this here would be the first ball. It can either be white or it can be black. If we're going to select here, um, there are six white balls out of 10. So the probability of selecting a white would be six out of 10. There are four, four blacks to choose from out of the 10. So the probability of selecting a black on that first ball would be four out of 10. Or the trickier ones come next because we're going to take that ball we selected and drop it into the second box and then we're going to select a ball from the second box. It can be white or black. So I want to allow both of those possibilities in the second round. And this is the second ball. Now the outcomes we're interested in would be this one because here we end up with a white or this one. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the probability of getting this path and then we're going to calculate the probability of getting this path, which also ends in white, and then we're going to add them together because these four outcomes are all disjoint. All right, these are conditional probabilities. They depend on what has occurred first. So if we're coming up this branch, that means the first ball we selected was white. So let's say we took this white one and dumped it in there. We may not have even known that the ball was white. They may not have even looked at it. It doesn't matter if we know what it is. The point is that there's another white ball in there that makes four whites and a total of 10. Oops. 10 total balls. So when we go over here, if there are now four white ones in there and six black ones, the probability of getting a white, four out of 10, and the probability of getting a black, six out of 10 because there are four whites to choose from and six blacks to choose from. All right, things change if we write down the probabilities down here, because if we want to know these probabilities right here, we have to assume that the first ball we selected was a black. So instead, let me choose and put a black over there. That means we still have three whites and we have now seven blacks in there. There's an additional black in there, but only three whites. Again, we have 10 balls though. The probability that if we first selected a black, so that makes seven blacks and three whites in the second box, then the probability of getting a white would be three tenths. And the probability of getting a black, seven tenths. Notice that on every branching, the sum of the probabilities add up to one. 10 over 10, 10 over 10, 10 over 10. All right, so the probability of white and white 
is six tenths times four tenths. The probability of black and white, and these are the only two that we're interested in, where the second ball ends up to be white, is four tenths times three tenths. So we have 24 over 100 plus 12 over 100, and that's 36 over 100. And that is the probability. So just over a third. A third of the time you'll end up with a black with a um, with a white ball. Rest of the time you'll end up with a black. 